Hello and welcome to Dialogue. China's top legislative body, the MPC Standing Committee, has voted unanimously to improve Hong Kong's electoral system. The amendments to the Basic Law Annexes 1 and 2 introduce a number of changes, including how the city's election committee, legislative council, and chief executive are selected. How will those changes affect key local elections scheduled to take place over the next 12 months? And will they help Hong Kong regain its prosperity and stability? To talk about those issues and more, I'm joined by Lawrence Ma, barrister and chairman of the Hong Kong Legal Exchange Foundation, Ho Zhengxin, professor of law from China University of Political Science and Law, and later by Edward Lehman, managing director of Lehman Li and Xu. That's our topic. I'm Zhou Yue. And before we start our discussions, let's take a look at what changes have been made. The two annexes deal with how the chief executive is selected and how the legislative council is constituted. Hong Kong's election committee will be expanded in size and given more power. The decision says the election committee will now have 1,500 members. The election committee will be responsible for nominating candidates for the chief executive and legislative council. They are also tasked with electing the chief executive designate and some members of the legislative council. Candidates for the office of the chief executive should be nominated by no fewer than 188 members of the election committee. These members should come from five sectors, including different professions, social groups, local lawmakers, and Hong Kong deputies too, and members of the national legislature and political advisory body. The number of members of each sector should be no fewer than 15. The legislative council itself will be composed of 90 members in each term. Its members shall include those returned by the election committee, the functional constituencies, and geographical constituencies through direct elections. And a candidate qualification review committee will be established to vet and confirm the qualifications of candidates for the election committee members, the chief executive, and the legislative council. The decision also states that the Hong Kong government is required to improve the system and mechanisms related to qualification review, adjust local laws in accordance with the amended basic law annexes, and organize and regulate election activities. So let's talk about those uh, changes to the basic laws uh, annex one and two. Uh, Lawrence, uh, the MPC Standing Committee, the top legislature, has just passed the changes to the Hong Kong's electoral system. Uh, what is going to be the next step, and what is the timetable for local government to enforce those laws? Well, as you said, the next step is for the Hong Kong government to propose amendment to our many local legislations that are related to elections. For example, uh, the Legislative Council Ordinance, the District Council Ordinance, and the Chief Executive Election Ordinance. Uh, the government has just announced that uh, the election committee election will be held in September. Mm -hmm. uh, the Legislative Council election in December and the chief executive election in March 2022. Mm. Now, I think the government will cram all these amendment bills before this July's summer recess of the Legislative Council. Uh, about the changes, the motives and, and the aim of it, many lawmakers and politicians, both in Hong Kong and Beijing, have explained uh, the significance. But could you please explain to our international audience uh, why those changes are necessary? Okay. Now, Hong Kong has no compulsory voting, unlike, say, for example, Australia. Hong Kong has a population of 7.5 million, but only 3 million voters. Now, legislators elected in our past elections had a mandate to represent these 3 million voters, but the vast majority of some 4.5 million people are still unrepresented. Now, these changes will allow non-voters' voice to be heard and their views reflected in the Legislative Council to shape uh, the uh, future government policies. And, and based on a recent opinion pose uh, by, uh, by different research groups, uh, it seems that 70% of people in Hong Kong uh, have expressed their support for the electoral changes. What, what do you make of the poll numbers? Well, I'm, 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 I'm certainly not surprised. If you do the math, we have, as I said, 7.5 million population. And take into account the, the 2 million or so 
Uh, they're hardcore protesters. They took on the, to the street in 2019 the anti-extradition bill incident. Now that means out of these total 7.5 million population, 5.5 million are not so are not so anti-government, and that is what what 73 percent of the total population. So I would say that the poll the poll result correctly reflects mm. the view of the silent majority. All right. Uh, I want your take on this, uh, Mr. Ho. Do you think the sentiment uh, among the public in Hong Kong have evolved over the years, especially since 2019? Uh, well, I should, say, uh, I should say that the situation since the 2019 uh, in Hong Kong suggests that the local people in Hong Kong, they also expect the uh, improvement and reform of the electoral uh, reform. Otherwise, the prosperities and the stabilities of the city cannot be guaranteed. So I think that uh, uh, this kind of decision also uh, they are supported by local people in Hong Kong. But we also know that the changes to the electoral system in Hong Kong have met with widespread criticism, especially from the West. So how do you think China should look at those criticisms and, and blames from Western countries uh, saying this is undermining democracy in Hong Kong? Uh, well, I should say that the, I think that Chinese government has done a lot to, uh, to you know, to, 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 to face or to react to these criticisms from the Western countries. Uh, on the one hand, China has endeavored to clarify the purpose, rationale, and justification for improve Hong Kong's electoral system. As you know that early in this March, when the MPC is in session, Wang Chen, vice chairman of the MPC standing committee, and Wang Yi, Chinese state councillor and foreign minister, has said, has made very clear that the decision aims to close loopholes and to remove the institutional de deficiency and risks in the existing electoral system in Hong Kong, and to ensure the administration of Hong Kong by Hong Kong people with patriots as the main body, which will keep the one country, two system on the right track. On the other hand, Chinese government has firmly expressed its position that it uh, opposed that the foreign uh, countries, especially Western countries, interfere with Hong Kong affairs. After all, it is a domestic affair of China, and, it, and China's and the decision made by the central government does not violate one country, two system principle. Instead, it tried to improve this the system to make the city go back to the right track. But still, the U.S. government insisted on sanctioning uh, additional 24 Chinese officials after the changes to the electoral system uh, was endorsed by the top legislature. So do you think China should respond in kind? Well, if you look at what the Chinese government and American government has done in the past, I think we can have some clue or the answer. Uh, look at what the U.S. government has done. On July 4th, 2020, the former President Donald Trump passed the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. And on July 14, 2020, Trump issued the administrative or the executive order on Hong Kong normalization. And on January 15, 2021, the U.S. government published the Hong Kong related sections and regulations. And according to these acts and regulations, the U.S. did not give Hong Kong a separate custom territory status anymore, requiring goods made in Hong Kong to export to the United States be labeled as made in China instead of made in Hong Kong. And so far, there are 35 million Chinese officials and Hong Kong officials were placed on the SDN list, mm -hmm. and 10 of them including Larry, uh, let, uh, Carrie Lam, are subject to the secondary sanctions. So this is what the U.S. government has done. And what, let's see, let's look at what the Chinese government has done. On uh, January 9, 2021, China's Ministry of Commerce issued number one order of the 2021, that is China's blocking statute, to block the sanctions unilaterally imposed by foreigners, of course, especially the United States. And on January 19, 2021, uh, China announced the sanctions on 28 American officials and lawmakers for having blatantly intervened in Hong Kong affairs. So I think that if necessary, China may mm. impose so-called reciprocal sanctions if it is necessary. 
in the future. But now the top legislators has made this a, a law, and, and Hong Kong will definitely enforce those laws with better clarity on the election process. Do you think uh, the spat between China and the U.S. over Hong Kong will come to a halt? Uh, well, I, I, I personally do not think so, because what we have found uh, after the Biden coming to office is that, that it continued the policy towards China. Uh, and what the difference is that it tried to coordinate its allies to confront China. So I'm not that optimistic. Uh, Lawrence, let's talk about the exact changes uh, on the election process. One major improvement is the formation and the composition of the election committee. Uh, well, that committee will expand uh, from four to five sectors, 300 additional members. Uh, can you explain to us why there is an election committee who is responsible for legislative council election and, and what purpose does it serve? Well, as I said before, the, we, we have a silent majority. Since this silent majority of 5.5 million people, uh, they are mainly grassroots people. And now they will be able to ventilate their views um, on government policies. People, ha people have to understand that Hong Kong has a very, is a very capitalist city, and our past election system uh, did so to ensure entrepreneurs and, business and businesses had their voices. But we have not given enough attention to the grassroots. So we saw many of the rioters in 2019, they were grassroots people because they did not receive enough attention from the government before. And it is necessary now to give them ample opportunities to air their grievances. Uh, and one of the purposes of this electoral reform, we allow this unrepresented to be represented now. But what about the fifth sector mentioned in the uh, electoral system improvement? That will be formed by local delegates to the MPC and CPPCC, and also a member of related national organizations. Uh, why these uh, politicians involved in national politics uh, be included in the election commission? Well, because the, um, these group of people are from all walks of life in Hong Kong. For example, you talk about um, CPPCC members. They are not CPPCC members in the mainland. They actually live, work, and have their family in Hong Kong. So they, are, they know Hong Kong about it. They know where else, what Hong Kong uh, problem is, if there is any. And they know about the livelihood in Hong Kong. So if they are given a chance to have their voice in the legislature, they would be able to represent the views of those unrepresented, um, those 5.5 million unrepresented people, uh, which were not previously represented. They would be able to represent them uh, in the legislative council. So therefore, we have this fifth um, sector, a new sector that has been introduced to include 300 um, NP CPPCC members, NPC members, and members of the national organizations that they have representatives or council members in Hong Kong. So let's talk about the Legislative Council, uh, which uh, the election will come in autumn of this year, and it will be expanding from 70 to 90 seats and no longer be equally divided between functional and geographical constituencies. And instead, a new block of lawmakers that will be picked by the election committee we just talked about. So why 90 seats expansion is necessary and what does it mean for the Legislative Council's work? Yeah, well, the 90 LegCo, we call it Legislative Council, to, uh, in short is LegCo, right? The 90 LegCo seats will be divided 40 to election committee members. 30 to functional constituencies, and 20 by direct elections from geographical constituencies. Now, the 300-member election committee will be elected within themselves by secret ballots, um, so that we have they have 40 legislative councillors, so that the um, new electoral committee, election committee, will as as I said before, is comprised of uh, 1,500 people. So this time, the new expansion will include the additional 300. And also, the resolution stipulates a new candidate qualification review committee will be established. 
and details such as who should sit on the committee, how many members it should have, who should nominate or appoint its members have not been made clear. Can you elaborate on how that uh, screening process will pan out and what kind of uh, candidates will be vetted through, will be vetted through this process? Well, okay. Well, to, f to answer your question briefly, um, the chief executive, Carrie Lam, has just announced that the, this candidate eligibility review committee will exclusively comprise of principal officials from the government. Now, who are principal officials? Our principal officials are bureau secretaries, bureau directors, uh, the commissioner of police, the auditor general, uh, the commissioner of immigration, uh, the commissioner of customs and exiles, uh, the Commission of Ex Customs and Exile, Commissioner of the Independent Commission Against Corruption. Mm -hmm. um, the, the review committee has full powers and it is not subject to judicial review. Now, when you say, uh, when you ask the question as to who qualifies and who doesn't, very simple. Uh, someone who is a patriot is qualified to run. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter that person holds a different view from the central government. So long as he, he or she is a patriot, then that pe the person can run. So many of the Democrats um, in Hong Kong would be able to qualify and would be able to voice out a different opinion mm. in the future legis legislative council. Well, that, that's very important. Uh, as you said, some of the Democrats or the opposition parties might be able to be vetted through this process. So uh, it is not a fact that the opposition will no longer have a voice in the city's pol political process. Of course not, yes. The, the, it is important for oppositions to have a voice. But the most important thing is they, they cannot be helping a foreign government in overthrowing our establishment, our, 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 our Hong Kong government. They cannot collaborate with them to damage Hong Kong's interests or to otherwise sabotage Hong Kong with mainland China. And so long as they don't do that, it is perfectly okay for them to represent people, disgruntled populations, from our society mm -hmm. to have a voice in the Legislative Council, yes. But, but, but who, who is doing the defining job? Is it uh, the uh, review committee or is it uh, the, le the, the judicial system or the police department? Who, who's doing the defining whether, whether they are patriot or not? Well, the, uh, as I said, the, the name of the committee is the Candidate Eligibility Review Committee. Now, before that committee forms a decision, it will consult the Hong Kong police force, particularly the um, national security wing of it, so-called. So national security departments will have an input into the eligibility of an individual applicant so that if that person secretly collaborates with foreign powers to harm our interest or otherwise is a separatist or, or, or subversionist, Publicly, the public may not know about it, but covertly, the secret police or the, the um, uh, national security police would be able to identify them and have information to feed on to the review committee so that the review committee would have the full information of this person's character and credentials before the review committee makes a decision mm. on that person's eligibility. Uh, and, and will the review committee conduct their investigation on their past behaviors or future behaviors? It would be assessed on a, the person's past behavior because all this um, evidence that is being tabled by the Na National Security Police Force would be past evidence of that person's, for example, public speech, uh, that person's Facebook that person's public exposures and that person's affiliation with opposition parties and foreign powers and foreign governments. Mm. As long as these areas are covered, uh, that would give a very good picture of that of what the real political inclination and any real um, uh, pol uh, foreign foreign uh, connection that person will have uh, uh, a, 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 as evidence. Uh, and how will those changes? Uh impact the upcoming elections as you mentioned early for the election committee, LegCo and chief executive. Uh, will they be held as smoothly as people expected or there might be demonstrations on the streets again like in 2019? 
Well, I, I think 2019 is past. It is past tense because we have the national security law for Hong Kong. It has a very good effect of stabilizing, harmonizing, and uh, and also arresting those who were separatists who were conducting riots in Hong Kong. So I don't think in the future, as long as the national security law is enforced and implemented in Hong Kong fully, I don't think 2019 will be repeated. So future elections would be very peaceful. And of course, they will be competitive. But of course, it will be very peaceful. So as far as I can foresee, in the future Legislative Council, there will no longer be any filibusterings. There will no longer be any dragging on not electing the chairman. There would be no longer any actions um, viciously attacking the government or using the Legislative Council as a platform to attack the government's valid legal decisions. If the political landscape is, uh, as you just described, no filibuster, no uh, stalling of the political process any longer, what does it mean for Hong Kong's uh, decision making? The Hong Kong government would be able to run smoothly. The questionings from the Legislative Council would be only meaningful questions. They would not be malicious questionings. Um, the meaningful questions will help the government to, sh to shape the policies because the government will be able to hear voices from all different sectors of Hong Kong and because of the increased number of Legislative Councillors. And the government will be able to de deliver a, a much better policy to, for, to build Hong Kong and to um, advance Hong Kong um, economically, socially, and uh, as well as looking after the welfare of many of our Hong Kong population. Because you have to understand, Hong Kong has been dragged on and not developing for so many years yeah. because of our political um, uh, confrontation between camps and with particular foreign influences. Uh, from foreign countries because they wanted to use Hong Kong to state destabilize our central government's administration of Hong Kong. And, so, and with all this going away, uh, it will be a very smooth administration, I think. Have any observations on the interference from outsiders, uh, uh, foreign forces, been dwindling over the past few months because of the national security law and the amendment to the election, uh, election process? Uh, of course, but they can only do it externally. That's the, that's, that, that's the important thing. They cannot do it locally in Hong All Kong right. or use proxies. We call them proxies. Yeah, they can do it externally. They can, they can sanction Hong Kong government officials. They can do, do a list of sanctions and confiscating all these assets um, belonging to these officials. But they can only do it externally outside the territories of Hong Kong. And earlier we, we talked about the career po political prospects for the opposition members. Uh, if they can evolve politically and vow to be patriots and be involved in the political process, what kind of a political opinions and legislative agendas will they bring? Well, <laughs> that's a very future question because, I mean, I would pers you have to look, at, look into the um, role of a legislative councillor as given by the our basic law. The Legislative Council's function is to, is to, is to pose questions to the government, to ask questions um, of the government decisions and their policies, and to reflect views of their constituents. So that is their job. And it ha their job is to reflect views. Of course, if the government proposes a, a policy, mm. and that policy affects their constituents, that person, that legislative councillor, would have to ask questions, would have to propose changes, so that those changes would hopefully gather or uh, gather force and, and, and promulgate a change within that policy to benefit their, his or her own constituents. No. Now, that's the, the entire process in the future. So they, they must do some soul searching on their future work, the, the Democrats, as you said. Yes, because the Democrats also to a certain extent, represents a sector of our community. All right. They are, yeah, they, their voters may, be anti, may, may, may not be seeing eye to eye to our government, but they do exist in our society, mm. and their voice has to be ventilated through their legislative councillors. 
Uh, now we have Edward Lehman on the line. Edward, uh, now that China's top legislator has clarified uh, what the election process is going to be developing uh, in the future. Uh, uh, as, as, a, as a lawyer, how do you see this will pan out in Hong Kong? Well, I mean, as Otto von Bismarck uh, famously said, there's two things you don't want to see made, which is sausage and law. I mean, election law kind of falls under that rubrics as well. Um, do I think that this process is uh, is well thought out? And um, I, I do. And I think that the National People's Congress has taken steps to to make this, uh, you know, full and fair. And I, I think a lot of the people in the Western media don't understand, and I think it's been discussed a little bit on the show here already, is that the, the election system in Hong Kong was rather opaque anyway with, uh, with the functional constituents and the geographic constituents, and now that's being changed. And it, it isn't uh, democracy like we know necessarily or the republic uh, that we know necessarily in the United States. It's not necessarily like Europe, but it's kind of a mix between those two things. And so uh, what is missed in a lot of the Western media is that uh, that this was a rather opaque system. Um, and, and and now it, there is some clarification and some stability. And, yeah. and everybody wants financial market stability. Probably Hong Kong has been stuck in a limbo because of uh, this political uncertainties over the past years. And now... Uh, with better clarity, what, what do you think people expect the government to do as priority jobs, uh, Edward? As uh, the pri as the priority for the jobs going forward? Yeah, the, the, the government will, the will probably have more mandate when when they have the system in place. Right. I mean, there's there's this uh, tension between right who's in charge. I mean, is it the is it Beijing or is it Hong Kong? Is Hong Kong just trying to guess what Beijing is doing? I think that now things are clear clearer certainly, and mm -hmm. there's a pathway forward. And I think that the uh, what's going to happen is it's going to be a representative democracy, and that's going to be able to uh, keep a balance between. Um, representing the constituents, uh, the functional constituents, the uh, geographic constituents, and, uh, and and then keeping in line safety uh, and consistency under the national security law with, with regards to Beijing so that, that we can carry on and have Hong Kong be a stable place. So does that mean that government no longer has excuses to stall the process of housing reform, uh, economic inequality. Does that mean more policies will be put on the table because the political process is clearer? Yeah, I do, because I think the concern there, again, for a great many, the, the uh, Hong Kong economy is, is, a, is set to retract by, I think, 6.1% this year. I think 70% of the folks have actually looked to, to these changes as positive. And why have they, and this is something that's not discussed in Hong Kong, and you bring up very validly, which is um, the housing crisis. I mean, there's there's very, very rich folks, but then I think people don't understand that there are also people who are below the poverty line living in Hong Kong and the inequities with regards to housing. And I think that this is going to be addressed and it can be addressed in a in the situation that we have now uh, going forward, which would address and alleviate those concerns where, where poverty alleviation has been at the higher uh, you know, uh, priority with regards to uh, mainland China. And I also think that it's going to be uh, part of what's going to happen in uh, in Hong Kong as well under the new system. And so I think it's not just about the elite, but it's also about helping those folks in all sectors and in all levels of the economy. Oh, but that's probably what politics is meant to be. Oh, thank you very much, Edward, and thank you, Lawrence, for your insights. And you've been watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zhu in Beijing. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.